Today I'm sitting down with a very interesting guest because this guest is not a Linux distro maintainer, it's not a programmer or developer by trade. Today I'm going to talk to a theology professor who has a real love for free and open source software and is a strong advocate for free and open source software. And I'm talking to Corey Stephan. Professor Stephan, please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be on DistroTube. I've been a fan of this channel for years since since back in the obscure window manager project days um, before DT got all of his fancy equipment and all of that. Uh, so so um, and it's really I've really learned a lot from it. So so anyway, as you said, my name is Dr. Corey Stefan. Uh, Corey for good old Derek here, and I I. Um, currently serve as assistant professor of theology and fellow of the core at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. So I'm a Catholic historical theologian professionally and by education, but um, I also, and together with that, uh, do some advocacy for free and open source software. I've given a talk for the FreeBSD Foundation. I've written a couple of articles for the FreeBSD Journal. I've given a talk for the Free and Open Source Developers European Meeting, FOSTEM. Uh, I blog about this stuff and um, uh, perhaps most directly related to my work. I always tell my boss that we should be using free software. <laughs> and I have a statement on software freedom at the end of all of my class syllabi where I promise my students that I will work to ensure that they're able to have software freedom uh, as much as reasonably possible within the context of being at the university within my classes. So um, well, uh, that's a bit people, about me. <laughs> people say I'm a free software zealot, but you are the real diehard here. <laughs> 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 well, uh, how did you get into uh, Linux and BSD, free and open source software? Uh, how did you discover that philosophy? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So. <laughs> when I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, um, in the Ubuntu eight days, <laughs> <laughs> I had a, uh, my first laptop computer, and it was it was slow. It had I think 500 megabytes of RAM, which to the gray mm. beards will sound like well, that's rather a lot. But you know, even for that time, that was quite low. The standard was two or yeah, four it was. megabytes. Because yeah. I also had a machine during the Ubuntu uh, 804 time, and yeah. I was running 512 megabytes. And even then, yeah. web browsers would just run at a, exactly. a snail's pace. Yeah, exactly. So it came, it came with Microsoft Windblo uh, Windows. <laughs> <laughs> so that, did I almost say something crude? I'll, I'll uh, censor that out. Uh, no, nah, I'll leave it in. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> it came with Microsoft Windows, and um. I, I was looking for something better, something that would be more efficient, uh, something that had a lot more customizability also with regard to workflow, because even then, I did not like being limited in how I set up my working environment. I was only doing high school work things, but I didn't like being limited. And um, I, you know, did what... Okay. Uh, I did what any millennial does when you <laughs> when you want to find an answer to something with regard to computers. I think I was still using Google in those days. <laughs> and it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, the 2008 period was a real explosion in Linux desktop popularity back then That's because exactly. that was the Vista days where yeah. people that were using XP and loved XP really hated Vista. So a lot no, of that's people exactly started. Right. It was yeah. Vista. Mm -hmm. And so I found Ubuntu and it was on GNOME 2 then. And oh my goodness, did I ever fall in love with it. And, and with the CompKiz desktop or yeah. the uh, effects. Yeah, that was great. And then, um, you know, I went back and forth with different things. I, I was a Mac guy for several years, but um, basically, Max became worse and worse over time too. And once again, I found myself dissatisfied and I went, wait a second, I have all this background. I already did some of this legwork in high school. And uh, so let me pick this up again. And uh, that's how I found DistroTube. And that's how I how I found uh, RoboNuggies FreeBSD channel. And just kind of bit by bit, I, I grew, um, you know, all self-taught and I went from zero to hero. So I went from, you know, using Manjaro Gnome edition to, um, to 
using a combination of having read every word on every page of Michael Lucas's glorious absolute free BSD. Great book, by the way, for anyone interested in Unix-like OSs at all. It makes you better at Linux and better at everything uh, to do with this stuff. And a combination of that and uh, and Derek's videos, especially those about Spectre WM and uh, window management, uh, window manager configurations and things like that. And I wrote my own dot, fi dot files from scratch. I call them theological dots. They're on GitHub. <laughs> and I have a, in the FAQ, I have a little imaginary FAQ. Of course, nobody's asking me questions about this. I did get an email or two about them, but I have an imaginary FAQ. Um, and one of the questions is, why are these called theological dots? And I make a little joke, you know, right. well, they're not blessed by a priest or something. It's just, I'm a theologian <laughs> who uses my dot file for efficient uh, research and writing. Um, and it's great, you know, um, yeah. uh, because, you know, things like having a database of, of ancient Greek texts and um, a Bible study tool with six texts open in parallel, Zotero for reference management, LibreOffice with a bunch of extensions. The best of those definitely is this little known but really powerful ancient Greek extension for LibreOffice. It does spell checking even on byzantine greek that's wow, quite wow. accurate it's amazing mm -hmm. and so i can have all this stuff op op open in parallel all you know tiled for me and oh it's just wonderful and so yeah it's been it's it's and i just love exploring things to you i i think that's probably a trait that that just about all scholars share in common is, you know, we're nerds and we were, you know, I, I was just telling my students yesterday, how do you know that the kid who's going to become a scholar, it's the four or five, six year old who won't stop asking his mother and then his teacher, why, why, why? Right. <laughs> and so that was me and it still is me. I mean, I, I would say that's very similar to my path as far as time frame and then some of the reasons behind why I got into Linux and, and a lot of this stuff is really just to learn. It's just, I was interested in, in it and I wanted to explore it. It wasn't necessarily out of necessity. I, I wouldn't say, you know, I had to move to Linux. It was more of, yeah, I, I just wanted to explore this avenue. And the more you go down it, it's just such a deep rabbit hole. You'll yeah. never learn everything. <laughs> like there's, it's impossible to learn everything. It really is impossible uh, to learn everything. Getting back to uh, your work at the university, mm -hmm. I know one of the big reasons why you advocate so strongly for free and open source software is because you want to really champion privacy, especially for your students, because yes. these days here in the U.S., especially in the schools and universities, more and more, really ever since the lockdown, but even before the, the lockdown started, these schools are forcing their students to use proprietary software, proprietary spyware in many cases, where students have to keep a camera and a microphone on them all the time, even when they're doing their schoolwork at home. And of course, there's some serious privacy concerns related to that. And not to mention proprietary software, when you force kids to buy into one particular piece of closed source proprietary software, you don't necessarily know what that company is doing with this information because they're also getting the video feed and the audio feed from your students. What's happening with that information? No one knows. So you want to speak a, a little bit on that? Oh, that's exactly right. So I actually, a uh, blog post I wrote early in the days of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I, I wrote, um, a part of it was writing about this problem. And it's, you know, instructors at, at colleges and universities found themselves saying, oh, well, I've never done any kind of remote testing before. And so I'm just going to default to using something like a lockdown browser where you're, you know, yeah. you're, you're letting your computer system be hijacked by proprietary code. And there are people monitoring your every move, even if your pupils and your eyes dart one way because you're thinking, well, there are all kinds of problems with this. Um, I mean, of course, it's running proprietary code. You don't know anything about it. Hijacking a person's private computer, running on their own home private, um, you know, 
uh, internet connection. <laughs> Who wrote the Chrome extension that these kids had to install? Yeah. I mean, that's another thing. The universities, yeah. they don't even think about that stuff. It's not, um, and it's not equitable. So I actually recently had a student write to me in confidence to say, Dr. Stefan, I'm really glad that you're doing this because I have a sibling who has autism and mm -hmm. he's always flagged by remote testing services as a cheater because he can't keep his eyes focused in one direction. And I'm going, well, how is that? That's not even remotely, pun intended, fair. I mean, yeah. that's absurd. I, I mean, he should, you know, he or she should be able to have, you know, the same educational experience as everyone else is having, and that shouldn't matter. And so there are, you know, lots of alternatives for remote testing. Their uh, essay writing always works. And something that I really like to do is have a face-to-face -face video chat, oral exam, kind of like this, right. and just have it be very welcoming. You can have your notes open. I I don't want to see your bedroom. I just want to talk to you. Yeah. And students really thrive doing that. And um, and they appreciate that I'm not saying I'm going to be, you know, I appreciate, they appreciate that I specifically say I'm not going to be taking over your systems. But, but oral examinations require the teacher to, to work a little harder. And yes, I think in some do. cases, they you do. know, that, that part of the problem is just the school system's trying to be economic as far as their time, you know, no, unfortunately. That's the, no, that's exactly right. So I, so the University of St. Thomas is a small liberal arts college. And so I'm blessed that I don't have hundreds and hundreds of students. Um, I may have a hundred or students, you know, total or something like that. Um, so it's hard to schedule all of that, but I'm able to do so. Yeah, a, a full professor at a big state university who has, you know, 2000 students in, you know, three conglomerate lecture halls. Well, that person's not going to be going to be able to do one on ones with every student. But that there are still ways, of, you know, where you don't have to be. Well, I, I even I even think at the really big institutions, you know, you could have enough graduate assistants also to to give some of these oral examinations where it could. I I don't know. It's tricky, right? Yeah. It's 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 it'll be a tough problem to solve. But I do think having a camera having to be on a person in their home is also a tricky situation. I know technically they're at school, but in real life they're at home. And we've had court cases here in the U.S. here recently, uh, especially involving the workplace where companies have fired people from working at home because they refused to put on a camera on them yes. while they were working at home because <laughs> right. for privacy reasons, they're like, no, I'm not turning on the camera while <laughs> I'm in my house. Ooh. And companies have fired these people and courts have ruled in favor of these people that got fired saying, no, you can't force your employees to have this camera on in their house. No, that's exactly right. And um, I've heard of cases where companies are hiring, say, from Silicon Valley who are doing this. Mm -hmm. And um, I can, wow, can I ever commiserate with that? Because, of course, software development is, you know, 10, it's nine parts planning and one part executing. And it's the exact same for me as, as a historical theologian. It's nine parts gathering all of my resources, reading them, taking notes on them, and one part writing. And so if I had somebody, you know, spying on me while I'm working and saying, oh, you haven't typed a single word in the last three hours, well, that would be very damaging because I might not have typed a word in the last three hours, but I might have been working really hard, yeah. you know, to figure out what some obscure piece of Greek is saying uh, or whatever it is. But but um, and I think another same, important uh, sort of point thing. is the cost. The fact that so many college students obviously are not wealthy. They have to borrow money to even go to school, borrow money to buy books. And, and forcing kids sometimes to pay for proprietary software, I think is really unfair. No, that's exactly right. So so at the University of St. Thomas, I have um, a lot of first generation students and they're really bright and very hardworking. I love my students. They're great. Um, but, you know, they they um, not all of them can afford very much. Some of them, you know, they come in and, uh, you know, the best piece of technology they're able to have is a beat up old uh, retired, you know, work laptop that an uncle gives as a gift, you know, something like that. Um, or it's an old, you know, iPad two or something like that. And, you know, 
if if the tools that that we're requiring them to use do not run on those devices, that's not equitable. And not only is it not equitable, I actually am of the opinion that it's a breach of of at a at a Catholic university of our own uh, ecclesial law regarding the fact that we're supposed to strive to make our educations accessible to as many people as possible. Now, tuition is the greatest hurdle to that. Right. And part of that involves getting more donations and all of that. But things that we can do as instructors to help with it are include things like, well, not requiring brand new multi hundred dollar textbook purchases, but rather not not forcing students to buy a not, MacBook, not which is something many. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, all of those things we can. So. So, yes, you have to buy resources to be a student, but making sure that it's it's limited and sensible and that it's all these are things that you actually need. You actually need this textbook, but you can buy it used and it maybe can be a lower cost version or you can, you know, you have to have a laptop computer or something you can use for writing, but you don't need to be running anything high powered. You can just use Lubuntu and fire up, <laughs> you know, Abby Word and write your paper, right? You know, something like that, you know, very simple. So, so that's exactly right. Heck, you don't even need a graphical environment on Linux to use text editors. There's so many command line text <laughs> editors. Like, sure. there's literally not a machine that doesn't have enough power to run the command line. <laughs> like, no, that's that's right. That's right. Just about anybody can write a beautiful school report using LaTeX with Vim. Mm. And that's so, exactly where uh, I was going. You know, and <laughs> once you get into to Vim and LaTeX at the command line, I mean, that's so many especially once you get into the math and sciences, especially require students to eventually learn law tech anyway. Exactly. So, so even in theology, I, I make a strong point um, of, of uh, really strongly encouraging students to, to um, start learning the tools that they're going to need to use in their respective majors and really in their chosen career fields, even within my class. So I'll say things like, you know, you're doing a skit, a group skit for class today. Well, if you're in communications, go use, you know, this this open source script writing tool that you might use if you go work in multimedia, uh, you know, for a news network or something and figure it out. And that'll be a part of your grade. You know, I, I it doesn't you know, I want to see you flexing your um, stepping outside of your comfort zone, um, knowing, you know, with regard to computer usage, you know, points and click, that's not, that's very rarely the most efficient way to make use of a computer. Um, it's it's only most efficient with dialing a phone number or something like that. And, and there's no awareness of that among students today. Um, and I, so I try to get them to have that awareness. Yeah, there is this thing called LaTeX. And if you're in computer science or chemistry, I want you to go dabble in it if you if you have that desire to do so to to you know be somebody writing lab reports or or you know that sort of thing i want you to dabble in this stuff and uh, yeah that that's that's another thing that really um, I make a point of doing that, um, and and I try. And it's to just a, it's a weird it. kind of flex too, because now you have some of your students that are also taking a physics class, and they tell their professor they know law tech now. Where'd you learn it? Well, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Stefan, I'm not teaching. I'm not teaching them law tech. I'm just saying I encourage you're you just to go pushing learn them it. in that direction, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> to be totally clear, but but um, but but I like that weird flex. That's really yeah. funny. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, and, and then also, you know, I try to put into practice what I preach. So, um, I, I contacted the head of it and I said, can I install GNU Linux on this laptop that you've given to me? I know that KDE will work out of the box with the docking setup you put in my office and, um, you know, nice people, but the answer is no. So mm -hmm. I brought my raspberry Pi from home with FreeBSD on it and, that's what I'm using in my office right now because, um, you know, on the on the Microsoft Windows setup setup I, I, uh, IT provides, I can't even install anything. No. And so how am I supposed to do my work if I have to make a phone call when I want to install Zotero or LibreOffice or or uh, the terminal emulator that I want to use so I can be keeping an informative. IRC open on the side. And, and this is the problem is. with <laughs> with the workplace in general these days. Uh, so many places of business have their computers locked down, especially their Windows machines locked down in such a way. Many times they're running inside virtual machines. 
<laughs> and you, you really can't do anything. You're, you're, you have no permissions at all to do anything on that particular operating system on that machine. And it really does limit the amount of work you're able to do sometimes. I, I've run into this situation before as well. Yeah, yeah, it really, it really can be. Now let's talk about uh, some of the free and open source software, not just for your students that you think is important for your students, but for you personally. What, oh, what free and open source software is important to you and, and your work? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's always just about what the best tool is for the given job. So right now I'm talking to you in Manjaro KDE with um, Bismuth, so I can have all of my tiling window manager key bindings and all set how I like them and all of that. Is that, um, uh, is that Manjaro ARM on the Pi or is this on a... No, this no. is on a ThinkPad. So okay. it's, it's the 64... You know, right. okay. AMD sixty four, um, but uh, but I have you know FreeBSD on my Pi in my office, and that that ends up being mostly like for doing emails and things yeah. like that. But um, yeah, because I was asking because if you were on Manjaro on the Pi, I was going to have to rethink uh, what the Pi could do because this has been a great uh, stream so far as far oh. as the video feed and all. Oh <laughs> no, 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 no! Uh, this is this is this is orders of magnitude more powerful than a Pi. <laughs> The Pi doesn't keep up with video conferencing. All not at all. Not no. even the Pi 4. I bet the Pi 5 will, but I hope so. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's close. It just skips a beat. Um, mm. so the Pi 4 does. The Pi oh. 4 is so close to being able to be a desktop replacement. Yes. Other than the CPU is the bottleneck, really. Yeah. It's just yeah, that's it. yep. not quite. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so, anyway, at that level, I, I, I really believe in using the tool for the job. So, I'm, Manjaro KD because I'm on I'm docked with my ThinkPad here and docking works out of the box. Everything does with the latest Linux kernels and Manjaro makes it really easy to set up the latest kernel and all of that. I, I'm even able to choose what kernel I want, which is pretty nice. You don't find a, a rolling release distribution unstable because that's what I get asked all the time. <laughs> well, uh, I do um, actually. You do? Okay. Yeah. Um, I've had some problems actually with the rolling release in the past. So um, uh, there was a LibreOffice fresh branch update that was pushed as a part of a Manjaro update that made my whole dissertation uneditable for a day. That's not fun. <laughs> I, I've run into the same problems because I depend on OBS, Caden Live, and GIMP. I use those three yeah. tools almost every day to do what I do. So I've decided I can't have those rolling anymore. I don't yeah. install them through Pac-Man anymore. I have app images for them all, and I just never go get the new version. If the version I'm on is working, I just keep that app image. I never want that thing to update because the update, the only thing it's going to do is potentially break something. It's not going to give me anything. If what's working is working, there's there's no need to have it rolling. No, that's right. So I, so I like it, and I don't. There are pros and cons. Yeah, I think with this exact setup here. Basically, as soon as like uh, Debian stable has has a newer has a newer kernel, I'll just stick with I'll just switch to that and stay with that for time eternal. And you know, it's just different needs. Um, I don't I really don't need the rolling other than that everything works out of the box right now with this exact setup. So again, it's all about the best tool for the job, and then this for this job that's Manjaro right now. Yeah, if um, I didn't do what I do with videos and didn't need sometimes to test out the latest and greatest software, I would be a Debian stable user. That's kind of what I was before starting YouTube. I always ran static release distributions. The idea of running a rolling release just seemed ridiculous to me until I needed to actually test some of this software. And then it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. That's right. If I ever retire from YouTube, though, I'm, I'm going back to Debian. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the quotation that everyone places in the comments. For I'm going to get hate comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being very, I'm trying to be very politically neutral with regard to what uh, Unix like operating system is best. And mm -hmm. then, and then, you know, you just said that it's kind of a bomb drop, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, as far as some of the tools that I that I use for myself, those software applications that are available that are all free and open source, I've talked about Zotero. That's really, really potent okay. for citation management. And um, one thing that's great about that is um, 
I mean, there, there's a Firefox extension and a LibreOffice extension. And so all three then of those great open source tools just work together seamlessly. I'll be, you know, if most library database websites are running the same software and, uh, or, or the same database rather, um, right. I didn't say that quite correctly. Anyway, there, most of them are running the same stuff. And so Terra detects that stuff automatically in the extension. So you just click add to library in the Firefox extension and then poof, it's there in Zotero locally um, and being synced with Zotero's secure server. Um, and then uh, it's just, you know, a quick either keystroke command or one click in the LibreOffice document to add that citation. and. It is so seamless and powerful, and it's all completely free and open source software. Um, and then within uh, Firefox, I use a ton of extensions that are really useful for work. It is very straining on the eyes to read student work, for example, on a computer screen. So being able to switch everything to dark mode. I mean, just simple things like that, yeah. that sounds so obvious, but they're just so useful. In LibreOffice, I normally am running a, a venerable suite of extensions, a Latin language spell checker, the Greek extension that I was talking about earlier. It's it's just called Ancient Greek, and it's available for OpenOffice and LibreOffice. And um, one of the things about with free and open source software, we have a ton of really good spell checkers. We have a ton yes, of good translation yeah. programs. Like a lot of people that come from like the proprietary software world, I think would be shocked at how well we do in that particular area. No, that's right. So, so another, yeah, a, a couple of things right there. I use a bunch of command line utility tools. There's one called Whitaker's Words that's existed for decades now, but it's a Latin word parsing tool and it is so potent that it's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, you can compile it in any Unix like OS it's in the AUR, you know, so on and so on. And so normally I, I just type Latin <laughs> enter in my terminal emulator and poof, I can, I get this great word parsing where I get the declension, I get a short definition and wow, does that ever say, I mean, the number of hours saved from doing that versus opening um, a big physical lexicon and flipping through the pages is absolutely uncanny. Um, I use a uh, Greek Bible in the terminal. Um, so, um, and, and Latin Bible in the terminal, uh, Luke Smith, actually, um, mm. here's, here's another one that's going to invoke some comments for this video, but just to talk about his repositories that he hosts in GitHub, some, a couple of things that he hosts that are really great, uh, for community service as a whole are these, uh, terminal based, uh, Bibles. And, um, you just, I can type GRB for Greek Bible and then say, you know, Mark one and poof, there's Mark one in, in the, the original new Testament Greek or in the Latin Vulgates. Um, uh, by the way, um, for people looking, thinking about this stuff, oh, I'd like to do some of this. Um, alacrity is actually almost essential to use because yeah. you really have to be using a modern terminal emulator that has full modern Unicode built into it right. from the ground up or the polytonic Greek text, for example, just doesn't show correctly. So it doesn't show in the, in the, in the, is it, uh, the suck, suckless terminal? It doesn't show an yeah, ST. Yeah, ST is pretty good with Unicode code, but it's not alacrity. No, and no. I can tell you one that's terrible. URXVT, yes. which I know is popular, <laughs> is like the worst terminal for Unicode. Yeah, support, that's right. So, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I've tried both URXVT and ST and Polytonic Greek doesn't show correctly in either of them, mm -hmm. but it shows beautifully and in any any monospace font that has polytonic Greek, the uh, the hack font has a really nice polytonic Greek um, um, hack nerd, whatever. Yeah. And so those, those um, and that all shows really nicely in Alacrity. Um, so um, that's just an aside, you know, for people who are listening, thinking, oh, I might like to get into this, some of this. You're, you're going to have a really bad time unless you're using the right uh, software that has full modern Unicode built from the mm. ground up, because it won't, it won't display all of the characters. So then you just get annoying boxes or nothing. So. Well, that's, that's another thing you, with the terminal emulator, getting back to not just the special characters, but also drawing boxes or, you know, uh, some of the mathematical stuff people like to do the ligatures. You know, if you pick the wrong terminal emulator, a lot of that stuff is just not going to render.
<laughs> oh, sure. Um, let's see what else. Oh, um, so I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm dealing with the history of Christianity mostly in my work. And then my teaching is mostly in kind of theology as a part of traditional Catholic liberal, liberal arts. But of course, I deal with biblical texts all the time as a part of my work. And there's this cute based free and open source tool that runs on the sword project called Bible time and Bible time. It seems like nobody knows about it, but it's available in every Unix like OS's repository and it is super powerful. And the developers are really responsive to comments to their work in GitHub. I've made at least a couple of points of feedback that they've said, oh yeah, we love this idea. It's nice to hear feedback from somebody who's using this professionally. Let us work to improve that you know, for you. And that sort of that sort of thing is really great and is something that I encourage people to do as, as you're looking to get into the free and open source software world, always give that feedback. Um, something with FreeBSD that I'll just point out that relates to that is I was getting really annoyed with um, um, LibreOffice and FreeBSD because it wasn't compiled with Java by default. And you have to have Java, the Java flag enabled at compilation of LibreOffice to use just about any extensions. But I thought, you know what? This is a really friendly community. And so I went into IRC to the FreeBSD desktop channel. And one of the, the people who maintains the LibreOffice port for FreeBSD was right there. And I said, look, for anybody who's going to use a full-size Office software suite rather than a lightweight something else right. extensions are a big part of that because we're probably using it professionally and we probably need the extensions that let us do our jobs professionally and within a matter of two to three hours he had enabled that flag for all builds of LibreOffice for all of FreeBSD yeah. and that is just really cool to have those community connections I and think a lot of people imagine that some of these software maintainers, devs, some of the package maintainers for various Linux distributions or for the BSD operating systems, they imagine that these people are not going to be friendly. Yeah. But no. that's usually not the case because I've seen people, I've seen people go to like a Linux distributions forums or IRC chat and say, hey, I really depend on this program. It's not in your repo. Mm -hmm. And within hours, somebody will package it just because <laughs> that one person asked for it. If it's you hard. know, people do this in their free time too, yes. you know, for... You know, just out of the goodness of their heart. That's exactly right. Um, funny, uh, another related story to that, and just a real testimony to the friendliness of the FreeBSD ports maintainers and kind of community overall. Um, in the talk that I gave for the FreeBSD Foundation, I said, you know, Zotero, we run it in wine. We there was there's a group of us running a FreeBSD forum thread about how to keep Zotero running. Um, but I said, look, we need either Zotero or Jabref, which is another open source citation management tool, just for the sake of people doing professional work, whether it be in the natural sciences or the physical sciences or mathematics or history, whatever, doing this kinds of these kinds of professional, you know, scholarly work or writing. Um, we need one of those two tools to be in the ports in the ports tree and packaged and so i i issued a little challenge a little call to arms and i'm really proud to say that now there are not one but two <laughs> ports of zotero in the freebsd one that's based on linux later on the linux compatibility later and a layer and one that is a native build and they're both available so you can just do pkg install zotero pkg install libreoffice and they both work together now but you know that responsiveness um and you know, rather than complaining, if if you're not a person who's writing the code, first of all, here are a few really key rules to live by that um, are somewhat prof professionally inspired by me, I guess, by just because of the kinds of things that I do, but also just being human. If you're not writing the code, always just say thank you. Right. <laughs> and um, and if you don't know how to make the change find a really respectful targeted way to ask the question for the change to happen so don't just you know go on some tirade in a public facing forum about something join a private irc room and say yeah. you know uh hey mr so and so i love that you're doing this can we talk about an idea to make this better for people doing this kind of work and that's a great way to make positive change especially when you're not paying these people anything to help you 
or in some cases, these people are not asking for payment. They're just there as just a service to the community. Really, it's just, in a lot of ways, it's altruism, right? They're just yeah. trying to, which probably, now that I think about it, you being Catholic, part of your faith, altruism, I think that's exactly maybe that's right. probably why you gravitate maybe to free open source software. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm making a connection there that isn't there. No, there is, there is a connection there. Um, it's um, you know inspired inspired um, by faith and by just the kinds of things that I do. That, for example, all of my educational video lectures that I release on Odyssey, I have under a Creative oh. Commons license. Right. And it's you know I want there to be academic freedom, and I like the idea of the free exchange of ideas. I like that. I. I it's very important to me that we all be working together to it, it for the work that I do, supporting people's education, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, yeah. So and I should mention that, uh, absolutely right. I had actually met you on Odyssey. Is that's how, right. How we <laughs> did this interview, set this up is yeah, because that's right. That's uh, right. of my channel on Odyssey and you're on Odyssey. And no, that's exactly right. And, um, yeah. And, and why Odyssey, this is a great, a great line to go down. Um, so, when I was going, I, I'm very deliberate about all of these things. I, I was going to find um, in my new, so in my new position, I needed, I knew I needed to make a lot of video lectures and lessons and help guide students through really challenging, dense readings and things like that. A lot of students where maybe their parents, uh, you know, English is not their first language. And so getting into really dense readings, it's just a matter of guiding. And I'm really, I love doing that. It's so rewarding and so much fun. But I wanted to pick, I needed to pick a platform that was accessible to students and immediately intelligible to them while respecting their software freedom and not putting me at risk of corporate censorship. Because being a Catholic theologian, what are the kinds of topics that I have to talk about all the time? Well, I have to talk about matters of dogma and doctrine. I have to talk immorality about and morality and sin. And there's a lot of things sin. that. Yeah, it yes, could I, get flagged on YouTube. I, I have to use words like fornication, <laughs> right. like damnation. Mm -hmm. And those are all words that are not going to be received well in a corporate platform like YouTube just because of the nature of what it is. So Odyssey, um, I think that it gets misunderstood as like, oh, this is a place where, you know, paranoid persons or hate mongers go. It's, it's all conspiracy theories. Yeah, that's right. right. That's what it <laughs> but, but actually, why am I there? I am there because I could not think of a better way to protect my own academic freedom and my student software freedom simultaneously than being in Odyssey. And so is it perfect? It's absolutely not perfect. The whole cryptocurrency thing there is right. it's it's goofy to be frank. And I'm really glad that um my students just ignore that. And and I I you know. well, well they've moved away from it recently because yeah. now you can actually take donations in US dollars. And I think that's going to become the preferred currency on the platform now that that's available. So. <laughs> right. So that's that's not why I'm there. I'm not right. looking to get paid extra by being there. But yeah, just the idea of having um it well, being built from the ground up with 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 freedom in mind is just very potent. Yeah, well, as, as people imagine that like there's nobody moderating Odyssey, if there's nobody in charge, that's not the case. Um, certainly they have to take down anyone involved in any illegal activity because it is a U.S. based company. They have to follow U.S. law. Right. But unlike YouTube, they don't have a bot that goes around that's triggered by certain right. words or right. images and thumbnails. <laughs> and that's the problem with YouTube yes. is it's all automated and 90 percent, more than 90 percent of the stuff that gets flagged in YouTube did not need to get flagged. It was false positives, essentially. And that's what frustrates creators. It's because you put in so many hours of work in something and then YouTube just deletes it. Or sometimes yeah, they delete entire channels, ban people, kick them off the platform for no reason. <laughs> and that's yeah. really... You know, that's right. That's right. I come to think of it, maybe I shouldn't have used those words because this video is also going to be on YouTube. <laughs> well, it'll be all right. Uh, uh, thankfully... <laughs> I, I'm to a size where they're not as quick to jump to sure, sure. where I, I th they'll still demonetize a video, but I can appeal and they, it always gets reversed. I've never actually had anything that was actually striked on my channel. It was striked for a legit reason. And thankfully 
I've been able to get all of them reversed at some time or another. One of them, it took me almost two years, though, for Ugh. them to finally monetize one of my videos on QTEL. Because something triggered the algorithm on a video where I was <laughs> scripting in Python. That's... I don't know what I said while I was, you know, writing the Python code, but oh, something oh, triggered. Oh, you know, those tiling window managers, they're so, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're, you're, you're hacking. So, so therefore you're doing something, you know, mischievous. <laughs> well, I think that's great that you're on a free and open source uh, platform, like the library protocol, Odyssey being a front end to library. So I, when I say you're a, a free and open source zealot and a diehard, I mean, that's, that's really the case because... You're not on YouTube at all, are you? I well, I mean, I have a Google account, and right. Well, everybody one. has to. Everybody yeah. has a YouTube account, I guess, technically. Yeah. But but so I so I you know I I, I am on I, like I subscribe to some channels there, but right. generally I don't I won't comment there or anything like that. And and also here's you know YouTube has just become less user friendly over the last couple of years. I, I've I mean, seen the comments. Using, yeah, if you're not using yeah. uBlock Origin you know, or another effective ad blocking tool, some videos are unwatchable. Because the problem with YouTube too is it's a social network. There's mm -hmm. a social aspect to it with the community and the comments. But when YouTube removes so many comments because of their algorithms, and again, more than 90% of the comments they remove are just false flags that for whatever reason, Google decided to remove these people's comments for, for no reason, really benign comments. Yeah. And that frustrates people that are trying to have a conversation when you can't have a conversation because the comment you took time, five minutes to write this paragraph, and then it just instantly gets deleted. You know, that, that's, that causes people to explore alternatives. No, that's right. And um, yeah, and, you know, maybe somebody watching this video in five years will be in a situation in which there are better alternatives or better places to host video content. But for right now, I just decided on Odyssey. Well, Corey, one last thing I wanted to talk about with you for free and open source software, uh, getting a l away from the software you use for work and, you know, for business, essentially, right, to earn a paycheck. What about software for fun, free and open source gaming? <laughs> oh, what a great question. Uh -huh. um, so obviously, Zero AD is the best free and open source computer game and maybe the best computer game that exists. <laughs> So I, I love Zero AD. You, you have a point with that one. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's one of the best. I think it's the best real-time strategy game out there. Oh, it's, it's so fun. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's built. Um, so I don't get much time for, for to do that sort of thing. I'm just so busy with work and uh, my wife and children and uh, so on. Um, but um, you the know, historian, I, though, you being, you know, really yeah. as a theology professor, you deal a lot with history. Yeah, you probably love the historical aspect of all oh. the various historical figures in the game. All the heroes, of course, are uh, real people that you know led these the, civilizations. Yeah, the 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 makers of Zero AD. Uh, something that I love about the project, and and one reason why I really say, yeah, it's it it's definitely the best free and open source game out there right now. Although there are several that are really great and fun to play. I mean, there are flight simulators and space mm -hmm. simulators and all these things. But I, I mean, one thing that's so great about it is they have a really fanatical attention to detail. And I love that. I mean, there's you, it couldn't be like that with a proprietary project because it, you you really just have to have a community based project where a bunch of eyes are looking over it and it, it's people doing it for the love of the thing for for there to be such fanatical attention to detail. I mean, in the forums, people are citing scholarly publications about ancient civilizations as the reasons for, you know, making certain decisions about what their units ought to look like or what characteristics yeah. they ought to have. The, the, and the Greek um, civilizations. Um there's three of them in the game. The, the yes. fact that the characters speak Greek <laughs> like yeah, when you the click on them. Speak Greek, the <laughs> Romans, they speak Latin. Latin you know, yeah. the, and, and the pronunciation for those things is it's all of it is actually exquisitely done. As in, I am, I, I don't know um, who the people are behind that. I, I, I want to look into that, but I'm certain that they've, that they've had professional consultations. That well, they, I, I think this is a situation people. where being <laughs> open source helps them because they can source all of this pronunciation right. from people all over the world that would be much more familiar 
you know, for example, the correct Greek and Latin and Persian, you know, all, all these languages that are in the game that a proprietary company would actually have to go probably pay people to do where you could just put out a call to the community and they'll take care of translation for you. Yeah. And it's not just the, I mean, it's restricted. It's it's restored or the what we typically call restored ancient pronunciation. So it's mm -hmm. even at the level of we want it to sound as close as we can approximate to how the people sounded in, you know, right. in antiquity speaking these languages. And oh, my goodness, it's just so much fun. It's so fun, in fact, that um, I, I've been asked to teach a, a Greek class this spring. And I'm planning on using zero AD. Um, if my dean is listening to this video lecture, I'm using going to use zero AD as a highly effective educational resource. Uh, so that's for my <laughs> boss. <laughs> but um, but but you know, there's team building in there. The um, and the Greek is great, and and it's just yeah, it's a lot of fun. And you can run it on anything. It's available in every you know it's available as an app image so you can run it on any GNU Linux distribution it's in the FreeBSD repositories OpenBSD NetBSD Mac OS Microsoft Windows if basically if a person is running a computer that has a reasonably recent graphics card or an integrated one from a recent processor the person can run can run zero AD and that makes it a lot of fun too cuz you can like you know I can play, you know, against the, like my brother and I will play against each other and, you know, tif totally different. I can host it on a ThinkPad for heaven's right. sake. You know, that's, that's something. Well, I love zero AD. So that's great to hear. And I, again, I think that, yeah, if you're a fan of history, you'd love the game. I think yeah, everyone and, should check out that game. Yeah. And you have my professional imprimatur that it's, <laughs> that it's, that it's, um, that, wow, have they ever done a good job with the attention to detail? I mean, it's a game. So fun is first, but those other, the, the attention to detail with, with making the heroes and, and all their characteristics that they have and the architecture and everything is just, it's really good. <laughs> One minor gripe I have with the game is the name of the game zero ad people often make the mistake of thinking there is actually a year zero AD. Oh, right <laughs> because <laughs> right. i even w back in my school days you know people would talk about the year zero or zero ad or right. and it's like no because one bc the year after that was one ad there was that's no zero right. there's no year zero yeah, that's right <laughs> it's, it's a, right it, which is why they named it that was to be mm -hmm. clever because yeah. it's, an, it's imagined time that never existed mm -hmm. just you know just like for example you know it was you know it was never the case that most of these civilizations were at war with each other the right. romans the romans were never at war with you know with with um you know, like uh, the Egyptian civilizations, the like uh, you yeah. have yeah, right, and the Chinese, yeah, yeah. and the yeah. Indian civilizations, and yeah, but um, but it's but you can do the fun. Spartans and the Persians, and that makes sense, right? Right. right? So okay. you can relive the movie Three Hundred. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, so you can, uh, we, we are Sparta. So, yeah. um, that, oh, it's so much fun. Um, you know, one other thing that I just like to point out, I know that we're winding down here, is that. While I tend to stand alone right now in the world of Catholic theology, it's not as though the things that I'm advocating and the reasons for them are entirely without precedent. I mean, at the Vatican archives, there are 80,000 manuscripts that are being digitized. This is a multi-decade long process. And the file type that's been chosen for that is the open imaging file type that NASA produces. And why? Well, it's really high quality and it's an open standard that will never go obsolete. Right. <laughs> so, so if you're going to go through this extremely expensive, extremely technically um, precise process that takes years and years and years with a whole team of scholars and so on, well, of course you need to have it be an open standard. Now, you I can't mean, use a proprietary format, not for something that you want to be able to be opened centuries from now yes if, if you choose proprietary software it's going to be obsolete within a few years the company that made that proprietary format could be bankrupt within your lifetime right so yeah. it's not like it's going to be around 500 thousand two thousand years from now those documents will be lost if you depend on yeah that's that's exactly right and and it's supposed to be the end goal for that project is to have basically all of the vatican archives available 
for the whole world um, in a digitized format. And of course, they really have to be largely locked down in their physical form um, because that's the only way to protect many of the right. materials. And but once you've digitized them, then anybody can look at them in really high quality graphical images from anywhere in the world with a high speed internet connection. And, you know, that project is under is under work. And there are other projects like that where it's, well, of course, it's it's just using open standards because the mm -hmm. open standards are what are have the best odds of security. They're what have the best odds of um, long term um, usability there, you know, um, so on and so on. The list just goes on of the benefits of, of employing open source standards. software never dies. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. It'll still be. Yeah. So those images, the idea is that somebody could could write a tool to use them on whatever, you know, quantum computers we're using, <laughs> you know, 250 years from now. So right. which is really beautiful to think about building that for posterity now. Well, that's a good point. Well, Corey, would you like to disclose any contact information? Uh, where can people follow you online? You got any social media accounts? Obviously, you have an Odyssey channel. Sure. So if anyone is, is interested in watching videos from, from a, a free software geek, um, but they're instructional videos about Catholic theology and, and history and liberal arts, you can, of course, go to my Odyssey page. Um, um, that's uh, my channel is just Corey Stephan, PhD. Um, but but the website, which is where I blog and I blog about using free software, and I kind of keep everything consolidated there, is just coreystephan.com, C-O-R-E-Y-S-T-E-P-H-A-N.com. I like to keep things nice and simple. Um, I don't like to manage a huge online presence. I like to manage one tidy uh, little professional presence. And so that's what it is. Um, okay. And so that's the best place to go. I'll be sure to link to those in the video description for this video as well. Sure. And oh, and if somebody wants to write to me to ask questions about anything, I have a little contact form right there. And um, unlike a lot of <laughs> private website contact forms, I keep that up to date and I always respond immediately when somebody writes to me there. So that's the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, great. Well, Corey, thank you for talking with me today. And thank you for all your hard work in promoting free and open source software. And I especially appreciate that you're fighting for your students as far as privacy rights and, and our school systems and universities. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, I always, um, I know that some people might think, oh, you know, Derek uh, Taylor of DistroTube, he has just this really cool job where he just gets to sit around and talk about uh, GNU Linux and free software all day. And it is a really cool job. <laughs> and he does, there's, an ex there's a degree to which yeah. that's what's happening. But I always describe you first as an educational content creator, as in you are teaching people how to be really empowered to take ownership of our digital lives. And wow, is I mean, thinking about it in those terms, it's it's so much more than just a really cool job. It's also a really important job. Well, I appreciate that, Corey. Well, thanks for hanging out with me. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yes, you too. Take All care. Right, thanks. Peace.